I was blessed at one of my congregations to have a ceramic artist as a member of the congregation. He was also the SPRC chair. And he didn't call himself a potter because potters usually work at a wheel. But he had been a professor of ceramic arts at a college in Georgia. And he just decided he didn't want to teach anymore and he wanted to sell his own materials. So he made these beautiful, beautiful ceramic pieces. I have some of them that he gave me through the years as gifts. But this was coming up in the lectionary and I said to him, Charlie, I want you to bring your potter's wheel to church. And he said, what? I said, on a Sunday morning, coming up, I want you to bring your potter's wheel to church. And he said, I haven't thrown a pot in so many years. Are you kidding me? And he said, you know, it throws a lot of clay around. I said, we'll put down some, some plastic. The trustees were thrilled with that one. But we had the chancel lined with plastic and we had his potter's wheel. And he said, yeah, let me get this right. You want me to throw a pot that's perfect or imperfect the first time and then the second time it needs to be perfect. I said, yep, you got it. And he said, I've never thrown a perfect pot in my life, which is why I don't work at a wheel. But he brought the wheel in and he set it up and you know, people were fascinated. Some people came forward to watch him as he, and he, for that first one where it says, you know, I went down to the potter's house there, was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. He made the most perfect thing he said he ever made in his life. And then it was like, it had to be spoiled, so he stuck his finger in it and so it went all wonky and sideways. He said it broke his heart to do that. But then the next one he made was even more perfect than the first. Now, why did I do something that crazy? That's what the trustees are still asking themselves. Why does she do these crazy things? Because it didn't say God said, picture a potter's wheel in your head. He said, go to the potter's house and watch this happen. Anyone here ever thrown a pot on a wheel? You're probably afraid to say that now because you'll think I'm going to ask you to do it. How'd yours turn out, Neil? Not so good. Not so good. <laughs> Toby, how about yours? <laughs> By the end, it was pretty good, huh? How many tries did it take you to get something? How tall did you make something? And I have some communion cups that I've gotten on discount racks through the years that sort of lean a little bit or one side's a little bit crazy looking and things like that. It is very hard to get something very straight that will hold water, much less the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ on a Sunday morning. But it's a beautiful example, isn't it, of how we're supposed to be in God's hands. And I always tease Milt when I'm up here and I need somebody to do a lovey-dovey thing. It's always Milt and Linda. One thing, because he's sitting right there, and the other is because he still tells the story of when they met. He can look back, and that's been a couple of years, right? Like three, four, five, six, seven years ago, something like that now? <laughs> Just a couple of years. 60. 60. But he remembers seeing her for the first time and how he felt, and he still feels that way, and that is a great and glorious gift. So, that's why I pick on him a little bit with that when it comes to the lovey-dovey stuff. But he was putty in her hands. I mean, when I thought, when I was looking this up today, not today, when I was working on this sermon for this morning, I thought, who is putty in someone's hands? I thought, Milt Roth is putty in his wife's hands. <laughs> but you know who else is? Everyone here who is a grandparent is putty in that little baby's hands. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Especially the first time you see that child, right? You think, my kids were pretty good now. This one's perfect. This one's absolutely the most wonderful child who ever walked the earth. You know what it is. And if that baby cries, I have seen 300 pound linebacker tough men melt at a baby's coo. It's so wonderful when you walk in, they don't know you're there, they're talking, coochie, 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 baby, did and they look at you like, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really mean that. But we know what it is to be putty in someone's hands. But you don't really like that idea of yourself, do you? Because what does it mean if you're putty in someone's hands? It means you're totally succumbing to their will, right? Now, suppose it was your daughter who came home and said, I am putty in his hands, and you haven't met the boy yet. Ooh, look at that face. we got somebody who's going, no, 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 not going to happen, right? Because what do you have to have to be putty in someone's hands? What do you have to have for that person? Absolute faith and trust that what they're going to do for you or to you or with you is just really going to be absolutely what's the best for you. So God is saying, O oh Israel, you are the clay and I'm the potter. Which harkens back, like I said, to Genesis when God pulled together the, the, the soil of the earth and blew life into it and made a human being. Male and female God created them, it says. Ish and Isha from Adam, which doesn't mean Adam, it means human. God made a human and split it into male and female. 
And that's how we got our life from God, in God's image. Not the way we look necessarily, but the stuff that goes on inside of us. And we're supposed to see God as the potter, and we're the clay, right? But that's hard to do, because what do you have to give up to have a potter and you be the clay? What do you have to give up? Control, absolutely. Raise your hand if you love giving somebody else control of your life. You can? Do you give God complete control of your life? You try. We all try that, but how many of us would see some differences if we really said, okay, God, you are completely in control of me? Would it change the way you spend your money? Would it change the way I spend my money? I've called this before the parable of the new couch. When I got out of seminary and I bought a new couch for my living room because the one I had literally was built in 1942. I got it for $15 with a chair and an ottoman to go with it. But when it got to the point where every time you sat on it, the, the dry rotted stuff would rain out from the bottom, all that foam and stuff that had just dried. and I had to replace it. And I replaced it with a sofa that cost a whole $299 from Sears. And I prayed, God, do I really need to spend that kind of money on a piece of furniture? Well, fast forward a few years, I'm making more money. School's paid off. I spent $1,200 on a couch, didn't even blink. That one fell apart immediately. The $299 one, wherever it is, is still intact, I'm sure. That sucker was built. But I wanted one that was better looking, more expensive, that fit with my new decor. And the arm just fell off it one day. Fortunately, someone was sitting there leaning against it, it just fell off. What else would change? What else do we have to give God control over? Who we love. Ooh, that's hard, isn't it? Who are we supposed to love? That's, that's an easy one. Who are we supposed to love? Ourselves, but who else? Everybody. Everybody on the planet we're supposed to love. Do we do that? No, we do not do that. We do not do that. We are very judgmental. We hold grudges, we get angry, we get hurt, and we don't love the way we're supposed to love. How about if God controls who we're allowed to hate? Because we do hate people. Maybe not necessarily say, I hate you. We hate the things people do sometimes, don't we? How many of you would welcome a drug dealer into the congregation, do you think, and say, sit with me? Or someone who is actively abusing drugs, or someone who is actively abusing a child, would you want that person sitting next to you in church? Probably not. What if it's just somebody who looks different, who doesn't speak English, or who looks like they're from a part of the world where we know that we're not supposed to trust those people? There are all kinds of things we like to control. We like to control our own destiny, don't we? We want to decide where we live, who we, who we are friends with, who we like, who we don't like. We want to control how we spend our money. We want to be in control. We like being in charge. But then we're called to be clay in God's hands. What is it to be clay in someone's hands? Let me read you what it says on this package up here. I read it as a thumb. And thanks be to Katie who got it open because I could not get it open for anything. This is Crayola Model Magic. Soft, squishy modeling material. We're called to be soft and squishy modeling material in God's hands, aren't we? Sometimes we are more like, where'd my rock go? Sometimes we're more like a rock, aren't we? hard and immovable. Now, I did pick the gospel lesson to go with the Jeremiah, because what I'm doing is sort of flip-flopping. This is a lectionary reading from September that I'm doing now, and I'm going to do the one now. I'm going to do one that would have been this week in September, so we don't miss it, because it's a good one. But still, here we are looking at this, but I put it with this passage from Matthew today, which is a little bit different than the one that they picked to go with it. This is one that you never hear in the lectionary, even though it comes up in the lectionary. This is the part that comes between the two halves of the parable of the sower. You're familiar with the parable of the sower who goes out and he spreads seed, and some is eaten by birds, and some is becomes the weeds choke it off, and some sort of just runs away with the water. But then there's some that takes root, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And then the disciples stand there while Jesus is telling us, the story to the crowd, and they're like, hmm, yes, 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 yes. And they get by themselves, they're like, what the heck were you talking about, Lord? And then he explains it to them. But in the middle is this part we read today about, you know, I speak to them in parables so that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. 
With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, you will indeed listen but never understand, you will indeed look but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull and their ears are hard of hearing. They've shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes or hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Very much the same message as Jeremiah. Let's look a little bit at Jeremiah. Let me see what you know about Jeremiah. Here's your Bible quiz du jour. Longest book in the whole Bible is the, the prophecy of Jeremiah. How old was he when he was called by God? He was a teenager. Teenager when he was called by God. And what was his answer? Did he say, here I am, Lord? No, he did not. He said, uh-uh. I think you got the wrong person. I'm just a kid. What do I know about anything? I don't know how to talk. I'm not a good public speaker. Sort of the same exact answer we get when we say, would you like to be a liturgist on Sunday? I don't have anything to say. I don't know what to do. I trip over my words like I don't up here, right? How can I possibly speak in front of people? I'm not a very good public speaker. And God says what? God says, don't worry, Jeremiah. I'm going to give you the words you need to speak. You're going to be speaking my words, and I will tell you what you need to say. And it doesn't matter anyway, because they're not going to listen to you. God says that to him up front. What a great call, right? You need to speak on my behalf to God's people. But they're not going to listen. So Jeremiah, was he very popular with his peers? Nobody wanted to see him coming. Nobody wants to be a prophet. Nobody says when the teacher in the second grade says, what do you want to be, children of Israel, when you grow up? Ooh, ooh, I want to be a prophet. Nobody says that. Because prophets always have a hard word to speak on God's behalf. And the hard word that he had to speak was about what? Isaiah and Jeremiah had the same prophecy. One was the northern kingdom, one was the southern kingdom that if the people didn't shape up what was going to happen to them, what did happen to them, they were carried off into what was that word? Exile. exile. Very good. Exile. So nobody wants to hear him coming. And this is exactly why I've named my blog that has not been updated in a couple weeks. I know, I know, I know. I've got to get to that. But I named it The Fire in My Bones because Jeremiah, he's always pictures that bald man in paintings. Not that he was bald as a teenager, but when he lost his hair, was, he was always ripping his hair out of his head because he was so frustrated with these stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked and hard of hearing and hard of heart people because they didn't want to listen to God's word. They didn't want to listen to God's promise or God's word. They, didn't, they wanted to go their own way. They wanted to, let's see, control their own destiny. Don't we all like that, controlling our own destiny? And he would say, sometimes, I just want to go into a room and say, hey, how's everybody doing? Let's have a party. Let's have a beer. Let's put our feet up. Let's just talk. Let's, let's have a good time. But then he said, but if I try not to speak of him, I cannot. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I must speak the name of the Lord and speak the Lord's truth. Where did it get him? It got him thrown in a cistern. It got him in all sorts of messes through his life. He did not have an easy road at all and yet he is faithful to God's call. And he's very, very dramatic and very visual. Jeremiah would have done beautiful children's sermons because he once took a basket of figs that was beautiful and juicy and fresh and said, this is what we're called to be like, but we're more like this. And then he showed him one that was full of worms and shriveled up and dried up. And he said, this is who we really are. Not easy words to speak or to listen to. But God takes him to the potter's house. Not imagine a potter's house. God takes him down and says, look at this. This is what you're supposed to be like in my hands, so that you might be brought up into something beautiful. Now, my friend Charlie, who was the potter, said to me, he was the ceramic artist, excuse me, not a potter. He used to say all the time, I'm not a potter, I'm a ceramic artist. My friend, the ceramic artist, Charlie, told me something I did not know about clay. Until it is fired in a kiln, doesn't matter how many years it sat there, it will still become malleable if you put water with it again. And how hot is a kiln? Anybody know how hot a kiln is? It's in the thousands of degrees. We could say something there about until we hit the fire, we're okay. We've got time, just like last week when we talked about Jesus saying in the parable of the fig tree, just give me a little more time and I can work with these people. God is willing to work with us. So if you feel like it's the pot that is leaning to the side or that has a crack or a hole in it, God can turn you into something purposeful and beautiful, but you've got to be clay in God's hands. That's the challenge that we all have so that we don't grow dull in our understanding or refuse to hear or think or let our hearts be moved because God can do amazing things in people's lives. So what could God do for us as individuals? 
that's up to you to figure out on your own. And I hope you'll take some time to pray on this this week and say to yourself, where do I need to soften up a little bit? Where do I need to let God guide me? Where do I need to be the one in God's hands that I allow God to shape, that I put my trust in God to do with me what God will so that I become something beautiful and purposeful and useful for God's kingdom? Then we have to ask ourselves as a congregation, what can we do to make things different for the world? And we can do so many things. We've got to yield ourselves to God's will. One of the things we're going to do starting soon is we're going to collect shoes for school children because Bedonia International Elementary School needs shoes. We're going to have a shoe drive. Anybody here ever have a crack in your shoe or a hole in your shoe in winter time? What's that like to walk around in the ice and the snow with a crack in your shoe and wet socks all day? Imagine being a child in elementary school sitting there with wet feet all day, getting cold, getting a rash, getting fungus or whatever, getting just so nasty and uncomfortable all day. We could soften our hearts and do that. I don't think there's anyone in here who probably could not afford at least one pair of shoes. I'll tell you what I told my last congregation, we did a shoe drive for school out there. I said, what I want you to do is if you can afford a pair of shoes, buy a pair of shoes. If you can't afford to buy a pair of shoes, pray that someone who can will. And if you can afford 10 pairs of shoes, buy 10 pairs of shoes and bring them in because 10 children will have something on their feet this winter. That's how we put ourselves into God's hands. That's why we say to God, maybe I don't need to go to Starbucks and get my coffee this morning. Please don't sue me, Starbucks, if you're listening. <laughs> maybe I need to go someplace cheaper or make some coffee at home. Or if you come here, I'll make you a cup. It's got to be decaf, though, right now. Well, but maybe I need to buy a pair of shoes instead of doing that. Maybe I need to do something different with my money. Maybe I need to do something different with my time. One of the things I plan to do this week in the Adirondacks when I get there, I'm so looking forward to it, it is my thin place. That's a Celtic concept that was pre-Christian where if you, they believe that you're never more than three feet from God. And the, when the Celts became Christianized, they said, yeah, that's true with our God, too, and Jesus Christ. You're never more than three feet from God, but there are places that you go in the world that are thin enough that you can see through, and the Adirondacks is one of those for me. The retreat I go to is the Catholic retreat, and I have such a good time hanging out with nuns and a crazy priest and a bunch of Catholic lay people who always are saying, you're really a pastor, you're a priest? My goodness, tell me about that. That's why if you call, say, woman, pastor, Protestant, token, Protestant here. But one of the things on their agenda is to waste holy time with God. That's part of what I'm going to be there doing. That's part of my assignment is to waste holy time with God. Think about that concept for a moment. How many of you have had time to waste with God lately in the busyness of your lives? Where do you go to waste time with God? For me, it's the Adirondacks or standing on the beach looking at the ocean. Just think about the places you go and the things that you do that bring you closer to your God, and you've got to find some time. You've got to make some time to do that in your life so that you can say, God, I want to be clay in your hands. I want you to reshape me and remold me. Don't think that your pot is too old. Don't think that your pot is too broken or too cracked or too messed up to ever be something beautiful for God because God loves you exactly as you are, and God loves you enough not to leave you as you are. If you need to change, God will give you the will and the ability change. You just have to put yourself in God's hands. We're going to sing a beautiful old hymn soon. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still yielded. What a word is that? I said a couple weeks ago that red lights in Baltimore County are just suggestions. Yield signs mean nothing, I've learned. What does it mean to yield to someone? To let them go before you, to let them take the lead, to let them be the one to decide the course that you're going to follow. I want you to sing this song as a prayer because it is a prayer, and we're going to sing a modern version of it then at the end. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever new. Change my heart, O oh God, let me be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. <coughs> we remember who the potter is and who the clay is. We will be able to put ourselves in God's hands. We'll be able to say, maybe the shape I'll take will look nothing like I am now but I will trust you because I want to be putty in your hands, Lord, putty in your hands. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Please stand now and sing prayerfully. And if you don't mean it, don't sing it, but let it go into your heart and see if you can sing it then later. <laughs>